better than a quarter of a, better than a quarter of a century. This man's been my friend, and he's been the same. My, he's, he's not deviated anywhere. Amen. Preached this wonderful apostolic message. Praise the Lord. Only message that'll save anybody. Amen. Come, Brother Gross. God bless you. I was really glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, that is the same psalmist that really got his mind messed up at one place until he said, when I looked at the wicked and observed them, he said, that seems like there's no problems in their life. That they are rich and increase with goods and their eyes stand out with fatness. And, and, uh, and he said, but here am I with problems and troubles. And, and he goes on. He, he, he's, got, he's got a mental situation going on here. But I'm glad that's not the end of the story. And it also is good news that a man like this could find himself in a position like that gives me encouragement. But he said, this is the way I was until I went to the house of the Lord. Then I understood therein. Praise the Lord. No wonder he comes back and said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Because it's right here where God administers to our lives and our hearts and our situations. Amen. A lot of things can happen outside of church. Amen. That can give you a lot of insight into the things of God. But if you take this part out, you lose all the rest of that that you have out there. But when you are highlighted here, it highlights you beyond these doors, makes your work better, makes your family better, makes your life altogether better. Praise the Lord, because this is the blessing of the Lord. Amen. The blessing of the Lord is more than just goosebumps up and down your back. Amen. It's a touch in your heart, a touch in your mind, and a touch in your spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. The eternal springs of God that spring up into our hearts and lives. Amen. You may be seated just a moment here. Let me try to be as mindful of my manners as I can, and let me once again express to this uh, this church that we've grown to love over the years now, uh, how much we appreciate your prayers and your generosity and your offering, uh, uh, your kindness to us. It just uh, really is hard to express in adequate words what, uh, how I feel about all that, but if it will suffice, for the moment anyway, to give you just a genuine thank you from the bottom of my heart for this good, good church. Amen. And also that God has blessed you with such wonderful leadership. Amen. By, by giving you, praise the Lord, giving you Amen. A man that will spend and be spent for the kingdom of God and uh, give their life for the things of God. And uh, Brother Epley, as he said, we have been friends for many, many years. And when you've been uh, in a friendship as long as we have, you learn the uh, foibles and you learn the shortcomings and you learn the weaknesses and strengths of of each other as, as situations that you face and everything. But I can honestly say that from the day that Brother Epley and I have met, that he has been one of the most consistent men that I've ever had the privilege of being in a friendship with. 
Amen. Consistent in his dedication, consistent in his message, consistent in his friendliness. Amen. This man is a friendly man. He's a people person. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, one of the hallmarks that I have learned through the years about Brother Epley is his fairness. He is a fair man. Amen. It, it, he never breaches the word of God, but he always, always goes to the side of fairness in situations. Amen. As the Lord would lead. And let me tell you that he has been a friend in more ways than one to me, to my family, through the years. And uh, I love and appreciate Brother and Sister Epley so very, very much. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying that uh, just to, uh, you know, return his remarks, but I really mean that. And uh, I see your appreciation for your pastor as you uh, join yourself in uh, the congregation here. You know, that's what church was meant to be. A local congregation is one of the most family-oriented things, and I'm not talking about blood. I'm talking about spirit. Amen. Spirit family. Praise the Lord. And uh, thank God for good, good leadership that you have here in the person of Brother Steve Epley. I, uh, I feel a little bit, I don't, not just a little bit, I feel... Uh, kind of evangelistic here tonight of what the Lord has directed my heart to and uh, I truly pray I truly pray that the channel that God moves from here to the hearts of individuals will not receive opposition and will not receive hindrance, no kinks in the line, but it will reach those hearts as God intended and that if you would just realize that God is interested in saving you. That, that's an understatement. It's an understatement. I can't emphasize how interested he is in saving everybody in this building. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, he is able to save to the uttermost. It, it could have said that he's just able to save, and that had been a wonderful statement. But it says to the uttermost. That means to the nth degree. That means to the furthest rush. That means to the great, great distances that anybody could ever think of that God is able to save to the uttermost. Praise the Lord. He is the Savior. Let's stand, if you would, please. We're going to the book of Judges here tonight. And for a few moments, I'd like to draw your attention to the word of the Lord. I feel God has ordered this service tonight. I, uh, I believe he knows how to set the atmosphere, how to set the table. And uh, so I'm confident in what I have to say is what the Lord won't said. The rest of it is left up to you. Praise the Lord. Judges 16 and the 15th verse. Judges 16 and verse 15. This is a familiar episode in your Bible. I'm sure you are familiar with it. We read here at verse 15, And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. You know, I see a lot of artist conceptions of Samson. That's who we're talking about here. And they always show him with 
a tremendous physique, bulging biceps and muscle bound. But I personally do not believe that was his visage at all. I don't believe that you can look at him and say that he was strong. Matter of fact, I think he had been kind of the other direction. Because these individuals, if it had been such a powerful body, they would have somehow thought it was Samson's strength. But they asked him, where does thy strength lie? How can you be this powerful? Because it was not his strength. It was the strength of God Almighty in him. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. And he told her all his heart and said unto her, Thou hast not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And when she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called a man, she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. That could be the end of the story. To end his days blinded and grinding until he perishes from the exertion and from the maltreatment that he receives as a prisoner in the hand of the Philistines. Could have said, and this was the end. But it doesn't. For verse 22 begins with this adverb, how be it, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven, how be it. This one word changes the entire story. How be it, how be it. I want to talk to you tonight about God's how be it. God's how be it. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us here this evening as we gather our hearts in unison to pray and talk to him. Lord, we do thank you that we are gathered together in this place. This is your house. This is your people. God, it is your seeking and your wonderful ways that we ask to be initiated in this place tonight. Let it reach every heart, every life, and let the will of God be done. And we give you the praise and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the church says, praise the Lord. You may be seated. Many people confuse mercy and grace. There are many times, most often, as a matter of fact, used in a pair, mercy and grace. Usually, they're always hand in hand. And therefore, a lot of people begin to think they are synonymous terms, that one means the same as the other. But that is not the case. Mercy and grace are two very different attributes of God. 
two very different mindsets of God to you and to me. Grace is that unmerited favor of God that teaches us how to live. It is the instructor of our lives. The grace of God, when it comes into our life, amen, the schoolmaster steps to the board and begins to give us instruction in living and how to please the Lord himself. Teaches us how to walk. Teaches us how to talk. Teaches us how to manner our lives in this ungodly and untoward world that we are in. And so grace is something that teaches us, gives us a plan, gives us a vocation, gives us an administration of the Holy Ghost in our lives. When it takes over, we become pupils of the Spirit of Almighty God. That is why that, uh, you know, some people also think grace is only a New Testament word, but it's not. Amen. Matter of fact, you find grace, the word itself, early in your Bible. In the sixth chapter of the Bible, in Genesis, is where you first find the word grace. Uh, and it's there where it said, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Amen. And there, eight souls were saved. But what did grace do? Amen. It brought a plan. It brought an instruction for Noah to build an ark for the saving of his household. That's what grace does. It, it somehow teaches us. It gives us instruction. And so when Noah received grace in the eyes of God and was found in grace, uh, that grace became an instructor that somehow gave him the ability not to perish in the incoming flood that was on its way. That's what grace does. That's why Bible teaching is vital. And when that a pastor steps to the pulpit and begins to preach and teach to you, amen, you are recipients of the grace of God. Amen. You're not just some once in a while, every once in a while, smeared with a little bit of grace. Uh, but every time you come to church, uh, and the word of God instructs you and gives you guidance. Uh, the word is a light and a lamp unto my feet and my pathway. Amen. That is the grace of God giving you the insight, giving you the understanding. Amen. To teach you how to live and how to please God. Without grace, we know nothing. Without grace, we are dumb. Without grace, we are confounded. But grace teaches us uh, how how to live soberly and righteously in this ungodly world that we are in. Thank God for grace uh, that is still active and still genuine in the house of God. Amen. Mercy is another quality of God. Uh, amen. Mercy, somebody has said, uh, is when you don't receive what you truly deserve. Uh, it is an, an unexpected attitude of God to our actions. Uh, it is something that you totally, you know, sometimes uh, uh, when you expect a slap in the face or a knock down from God, amen, and the unexpected recourse of God uh, is mercy. The mercy of God is somehow, you know what mercy does? Uh, it holds you by the nape of the neck to get you into the classroom of grace. Uh, mercy is a thing that ran you down, caught you and let grace uh, begin to administer teaching in your life. You're not saved by just mercy. Amen. You're saved by the mercy. Amen. With the unexpected response of God. You know what? God would have been totally right and totally correct to have opened a trap door and dropped me straight into a red hot devil's hell. But mercy somehow stayed that hand of execution and judgment. Amen. And set me down in the classroom of God and grace stepped to the podium and began to give me instruction. I am so thankful for every instructive touch of the Lord that has come my way. I still love preaching and not just my own. You hear me? I love to hear preaching.
teaching. I love to hear teaching. I love because one thing, I know I'm a recipient of the mercy of God that gave me the chance to hear the grace of God instruct me in righteousness. Praise the Lord. There's a psalm in your Bible you know and it is the 136th Psalm. Every stanza of that Psalm, every verse of that Psalm, all 26 verses of it end with his mercy endureth forever. Over and how many times must you hear it? Amen. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. You know why it says forever? Amen. May not be forever for you and me, but because that God exists forever, his mercy will endure forever. Amen. Because God is mercy. Praise the Lord. The first nine verses of the 136th Psalm, first nine of them deal with deliverance or, or the creation acts of God. It has to do with the creative acts of God and talking about it was by his mercy that he first established everything that there is to begin with in the creation acts of God. Amen. To, to him alone doth great wonders for his mercy endureth forever to him that by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endureth forever to him that stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. Do you realize that in the creation creation of the heavens and the earth that was mercy at work that was a mercy of God already in other words he's laying a platform of mercy before you ever showed up he's laying a platform of mercy in the heavens uh, and in the earth uh, because his mercy endureth forever long time before you ever got here he already had an abundant supply of the mercy of God ready for our lives to him who made great lights for his mercy endureth forever to sun to rule by day for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night for his mercy endureth forever. So the first nine verses of the 136 Psalms talk about the creation acts of God. Amen. The foundation of God is founded on mercy. You hear me? Like I said before there was a man that needed mercy before there was anybody that had ever transgressed. Uh, amen. God was already paving the heavens uh, amen already surfacing the earth uh, with his mercy do you hear what I'm trying to tell you tonight our God is a God of mercy our God is rich in mercy amen praise the Lord but the remaining verses verses 10 through verse 26 of the 136th Psalm uh, amen all talk about God's deliverance of his people from Egypt land. Amen. Every psalm or song thereafter, every verse uh, and every line, amen, is his delivering power that he delivers Egypt out or, or Israel out of Egypt land. Uh, and with every stanza, it ends for his mercy endureth forever. Nine verses for the creation acts of God uh, that established the worlds uh, and the moon and the sun and all that there is in his mercy and then to put that mercy into action amen there's a lot more verses than the nine amen 10 to 26 talk about his delivering power to bring a people out of bondage to bring a people out from under a taskmaster's whip and bring them into a promised land amen for his mercy endureth forever you understand and what I'm telling you, amen, God paved this world in mercy and then when it was time to institute it uh, for deliverance sake, uh, that mercy went to work uh, and that mercy was set in action uh, because his mercy endured forever. Amen. You can stand up any night you choose uh, at testimony service. Somebody said, I don't have anything to testify about. Then you don't think very well. Then you 
I've sure have forgotten about a few things uh, because let me tell you, you got that seat by mercy. You got this house representation by mercy. You came in here by mercy. You drove down a road paid with mercy. Amen. You got in here because of the rich mercy of God Almighty. Amen. I want to give him praise uh, and give him glory for his mercy endureth forever. <laughs> praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I, I don't know if you know the song or not, but I really like it. Amen. Mercy rewrote my life. Oh, yes, yes, it did. Mercy did rewrite my life. Praise God. If you can see the before pictures, and I'm not talking about just the physical part, uh, but if you could have seen my soul, if you could have seen my heart uh, a long time before God found me, amen, you would understand why mercy rewrote my life. My story could have been completely different. Uh, matter of fact, I could be breathing the hot fumes uh, of the suffer uh, ionized region of hell tonight all Already, but because mercy rewrote my life, amen, from a drunk, uh, from a wayward man, uh, for somebody that wasn't looking for God and didn't care anything about God, uh, amen, I'm glad that he found me mercy, amen, grabbed me by the nape of the neck and by the collar, and God said, while you deserve hell and while you deserve a torment forever, amen, my mercy that I laid in the heavens uh, and my mercy that I put in the earth, is going to activate in your life because I can bring you out of bondage. I can bring you out of the bondage of sin, the taskmasters of transgression in your life and set your feet on a rock to stay. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I am so glad that mercy rewrote my life. Praise the Lord. Amen. All that brings me tonight to this episode with this individual that we know as Samson. He is one of the most intriguing characters of the Old Testament because he is such a contrast of such strength of God and then such utter helplessness that comes later. Amen. You should never, never, never take lightly the touch of God in your life. Matter of fact, it's not of you, it's of him. Praise the Lord. Don't think that God owes you anything. He owes us nothing. Praise the Lord. But Samson was born under a Nazarite vow. He came from his mother's womb as a Nazarite, pledged by his parents most Nazarites had to reach a certain age before they took the Nazarite vow. But from a child, this was pledged by his parents to be a Nazarite. That incorporated several different things about being a Nazarite. And uh, the, uh, again, the artist representations of Samson, because it, since it dwells on his hair, they always try to draw him with long hair. Even Samson didn't have long hair. He had seven locks that were never cut. And those seven locks were, were never scissored. They were never shaven. They were never cut. That's part of the vow. And those locks were entwined uh, closely and pressed to the head. Amen. So if you saw a Nazarite, amen, the rest of his hair is cut by the way. Amen. But those seven locks are never cut. Seven is God's good number of completeness. Uh, amen. It means I'm totally sold out to God shown on his head. Amen. Which is the part of the mind. Uh, amen. That which should be after God with all intensity. Amen. So if you saw a Nazarite, you'd see somebody that that had curls that were placed uh, very tightly against their head uh, in the varying positions upon uh, their head. Amen. He wasn't so much having long hair. He had seven locks that were never cut. Amen. That was part of the Nazarite vow. So another part of it was he was never to touch any dead thing. Amen. Because of his purity as a Nazarite, he was to partake of nothing of the grape. 
ripe, uh, uh, no form was he to eat, grape to drink his juice in any, whether it's fermented or whether it's just juice, uh, amen, he had nothing to do with any form of the grape or its vine or its leaves or anything else. That was all part of the Nazarite vow, just to mention a few of those. Uh, amen. He grew up and God had destined him to be a judge in Israel. That is why that uh, these judges come before Samuel and before they come before the kings because in that day God had judges in the land and Samson was a judge in Israel. He was hated by the Philistines. He was a thorn in their side. These arch enemies of God, uh, Samson continually, amen, brought them into wrath and brought them into such hatred against him because uh, of his actions against the Philistines. These Philistines uh, are those that uh, are haters of God and haters of God's people and there are heathens through and through. It's Samson that ties the tails that the foxes together and puts fire brands upon them and sends them through the standing corn burning down their corn amen that angered them greatly they wanted Samson out of their life they wanted Samson dead but every time they went to take Samson he overpowered them all amen he slew a, a thousand Philistines with nothing but a jawbone of an ass amen this man that's why they said this man we can't understand where his strength's coming from uh, amen the frail little body he's got uh, and yet we can't subdue him we send thousands of men against him and he slays them left and slays them right you know why because it was the power of God that was on him uh, it was God's power and God's strength uh, that he was working in uh, it was not Samson's strength it was the power of almighty God amen he tore the city gates off their hinges and carried them to the cliff edge and tossed them in. I mean, he opened up gates that they thought they could close against their enemy. But Samson said, no problem. I'll just take the gates out of here. And that's the kind, again, it was under the power of God. And every time they tried to subdue him, they could not fetter him. They could not catch him. They could not corral him. They could not subdue him because of the power of God. Let me tell you something here tonight. Amen. There are many enemies of hell against you. But as long as you can maintain a walk with God, no weapon of hell will ever prosper against you. You can tear off the gates that keep you out. Amen. You can somehow find, amen, the victory that you need in your life if you'll just stand up for God. Because remember, somebody said, I can't do anything thing. You got the first part right. Now just remember the second part. But I can do all things through Christ uh, which strengtheneth me. When I am weak, then am I strong. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful story this was going. Samson prevailing over the Philistines. But oh, what a turnaround takes place. Samson had a problem. It was his roving eye until that he began to find himself distracted and sidetracked until he finds eventually, to make a long story short, and I'm sure that you are up on the history of Samson, but he ends up laying his head in the wrong lap in life. Isn't it amazing how stupid some people can get under certain circumstances of life? Let me show you how stupid he is. This woman that he thinks he loves, time and time again, three times as a matter of fact, amen, she beseeches him to tell him where his strength lies. He tells her not the right answer the first three times. And every time that he tells her an answer, she applies that. And then the Philistines come. He shakes himself and defeats the Philistines every time. Amen. And yet he keeps going back to the same woman. He surely can put two and two together. It's this woman that's somehow in the game 
king of the Philistines uh, that are after his hide. Uh, amen. But he keeps going back and laying his head in the same lap. How dumb can you get? Let me tell you something. When you begin to take the power of God for granted, uh, you'll be surprised how stupid you can start thinking. Amen. Let me tell you, you need a clear mind. Uh, you need a right mind. Uh, you need a clean mind. You need a mind dedicated to the principles and values of the Holy Ghost in your life and those things that will keep you pure, keep you clean, and keep you on the right track. Let me tell you, where every backslider goes wrong, they start thinking wrong. Amen. That's the first telltale sign. Something begins to get into the mind and something begins to reason over the things of righteousness and the things of, of the glory of God until the, the wrong begins to make more sense than the right. Let me tell you, when you start thinking wrong, there's no telling where you could end up. Amen. Because with your mind attached in something the right way, doing the wrong thing, there's no telling where you could find your steps leading you. Amen. That's why you need a touch in your heart and a touch in your mind. Touch me, Jesus. Amen. Get the helmet of salvation that can guard your mind and guard your spirit. Amen. Take on the whole shield and breastplate of righteousness that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Praise the Lord. But he keeps going back. Time and time again. Until finally she has now said, now you've lied to me these these three times. If you really love me, tell me your heart. Where does your strength lie? And he was vexed unto death. In other words, she has finally broken him down until he divulges the secret. He said, the seven locks on my head, if they be shaven, I shall be as any other man. And when she sees that he has truly told her all his heart, she informs the Philistines, get ready and come up and bring me my pay, and I will deliver him into your hand. And so on occasion, Samson again with his head upon her knees, she calls for a man that comes with some type of barbering tools, a razor, whatever. Even now, now this is interesting to me. I mean, how sound can a man sleep that somebody can shave your head and you not wake up? That's pretty sound asleep. That's pretty out of it. But like I told you, that's where you can end up until that you begin finding the things of God cut away from you. And you not even realize, you're not awake enough in the spirit to realize what's happening in your life. Even let me tell you, shoulders, sho soldiers have been shot in battle, amen, with a mortal wound and never knew it until they bled to death, uh, until they hit the ground a dead man, even because they caught up in the battle and didn't realize they were wounded. Let me tell you something here tonight. When you realize that you are losing the things of God, however infinitesimal, however small they may be, then's the time to fight for it. Then's the time to get up and get after it. Then's the time to claw your way back to victory. Don't let yourself go until thing after thing after thing until your prayer's gone, until your worship's gone, until you your faithfulness is gone until that you're gone. Uh, amen. Fight for it. You hear me? Amen. Say, I'm not losing it. Uh, I know I've got some things going on in my life, uh, but I'm not losing my prayer. I'm not losing my faithfulness. Uh, I'm not losing my touch with God. Uh, I'm not going to go to sleep that sound. Yeah. And so this man shaves his head. And she has to wake him up and said to Philistines, be upon thee, Samson. And he arose and said, I'll shake myself as at other times. He had learned to take the touch of God for granted. Think it's his doing, not God's. 
I'll shake myself as at other times. But he wist not or knew not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. And so the Philistine easily overpowered him this time. You know what they did? The first thing they did was gouge out his eyes, blinded him. No longer will you see yourself in victory against us. The last sight you're going to see is your enemy putting your eyes out, blinded him. And then they carried him to the grist mill. And there they unhooked that beast of burden, that bullock, or that drove the stone round and round on the threshing floor, and they strap him to it, and they lash his back and drive him into compliance to grind on the threshing floor. Blinded and grinding, round and round he goes. Now let's just face the fact he ended up where he was of his own doing. He did. God didn't do him wrong. He purposely broke the vows. He purposely went against what he knew was right. He purposely ended himself in a blinded and grinding position. And this could be the end of the story. Could have just finished that. The last we see of Samson is haggard, back beaten, blinded, grasping to feel the things that are there, pushing that pole that's a hook to that grind, grindstone. And round and round he goes until his life is depleted and done. He would have got what he deserved. He would have received the just recompense of his reward. He would have been truly in the position that he himself had allowed himself to be. But that's not the end of the story. The adverb of verse 22 opens up, how be it? Howbeit is an adverb. It means nevertheless. It means in spite of. It means that however. In other words, not the end, but howbeit. The hairs of his head begin to grow again where he was shaven. He is blinded, and he is grinding. And I believe that, you know, the in, this small little stubble began to grow on his head. And maybe one day while he's wiping his face from the sweat and the perspiration of the toil that he's in, he runs his hand across the top of his head, and his hand picks up the small follicles of hair feels a slight little sign of mercy. Oh yeah. And I believe right then he began to take hope again because God's how be it has shown up in his life. It's saying I want to give you another chance. I'm going to restore you back. When God could have just cut him loose, dropping him straight into perdition. But when he ran his hand over his head and felt that little stubble, his heart probably did a double take, and he said, Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. A sign of mercy however small, is so appreciated. Amen. And then as the days began to go by, he kept feeling his head and his hair began to get longer. 
His hair began to get longer until maybe the Philistines didn't pay much attention, but he sure was until he finally came to the place that he believed that God has allowed him to be victorious one more time. Praise the Lord. And when it was, the Philistines said, bring out Samson. Amen. We're going to make a mockery of him. We're going to have a party and we're going to laugh at him when we bring him out. And you know what? They sent a little boy. Remember this is the man that slew a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. But to add to their mockery, they send a little boy, amen, that says, that's all we need to pull Samson around with. It's just a kid. And they sent a little lad in there and said, I'm going to take you into the hall of the Philistines. And Samson said, boy, when you do, carry me to the two main pillars of the building, amen, and set me between them. And when it was, that Samson was led out by that little boy. The Philistines are drinking their wine. They're mocking him, laughing at him, jeering at him. The great Samson is defeated. He's grinding our corn. Amen. But the boy leads him between the two pillars and Samson feels that hair on his head one more time and says, thank you God for the how be it. Thank you for a sign of mercy when I don't deserve it. I'm so glad you're giving me a sign I can restore and have my strength one more time even he said, uh, he said put me between those pillars and he reached out his left hand and put it on one pillar and put it on the right hand with his right hand uh, and there he prayed that prayer God remember me one more time hallelujah and the strength and the power of God like times of old uh, came upon Samson and he pushed mightily until the fell and the building collapsed upon the Philistines and in his death he killed more Philistines than he did in his life and let me tell you something you know why it's because of God's how be it I'd like to tell somebody here tonight the devil may have you convinced that there's no way back I'm telling you that there could be a how be it and you know it is you feel something it may be ever so slight but it's a touch of God saying come on stand would you please hallelujah the end of your story could have been backslider that whatever was done was done and you truly deserve to be lost <laughs> of course the devil will reemphasize that After you've embarrassed God, don't even think about trying to show your face back to him. You know, I've had folks that came to an altar and there they knew they needed God, but they, the devil so buffaloes their mind that they say there's some things I need to take care of first until I say, look, 15 years you've been trying to take care of it by yourself. You ain't never going to take care of it by yourself. The best thing to do is get in and let God give you the strength to overcome and be victorious in your life. But have you felt those little how be it, whatever they are? Just that little tingle that says you need to be in church. You need to be in church. That little tingle, maybe just, you know, just a little stubble. It's not evident in great extremes. It's just little how be it. It says, I can recover you. I can save you. I can deliver you. Have you felt it? Have you felt those little how be it, God's how be it? That when you, just before you go to sleep at night, 
something kind of nudges you in your heart and says, don't die lost. Don't die a backslider. Don't leave this world with a soul damned to hell. Some people think that, you know, it's a, almost a, a near head-on collision that, that they're waiting for, that somehow God saves them out of. But I found that even though those are sometimes happenings, it's those little nudges you keep feeling. That's true. It's those little pin pricks of the Spirit of God that says... I really want you back. I really want to save you. I want you to be what you need to be. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again where he was shaven. You lost a lot by drifting away from God. Shaven, so to speak. But you know what? If you feel real carefully, you might find tonight some of that stubble of it coming back saying, I can take you right back where you need to be, like it had never been, like it had never been. I don't know how many backsliders have returned to the Lord in this building, but I'll tell you what, when he took you back, he took you back like you had never, never backslid. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he does. When he takes you back, he takes you back. He doesn't say, sit in this pew over here because you're, you're not really worthy as the rest of the folks that stuck around. Amen. When, when the prodigal son comes back, he says, kill the fatty calf. We fix it to have a party. Amen. Amen. Because my son who was lost is now found. Who was dead is now alive. Let's make merry. Praise the Lord. And I can tell you this tonight. Good saints, amen, ain't never going to hold it against you either. They're going to be so glad to see you back in the arms of God where you need to be. How be it? How be it? Praise the Lord. God's how be it, I believe, is working in some people's lives here tonight. Can anybody 